This is my story. It is the story of our God, personally revealed himself to me in a small mining town in South Africa. I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish family in Krugersdorp, South Africa. Both my parents adored music. As a young boy, I learned to hold the violin. From a very young age, I owned a talus, spelled T-A-L-L-I-T, -L -L or a Jewish prayer shawl. Sitting in shawl, sitting in the synagogue, I would be enthralled as our learned rabbi expounded how God was a personal God. God spoke to individuals, to Moses, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to many others. But I pondered much how I fit into all of this. By the time I entered university, I became deeply concerned that I had no assurance, no assurance that God was indeed a personal God. I did know as a Jew that he was a historical God and that he did deliver our Jewish people from the hands of Pharaoh, but he seemed so far removed from me, David Eliezer Bloch in Krugersdorp. Where or where was the personality and the vibrancy of a God who could speak to me. As a student at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, I began studying for my Bachelor of Science degree in applied mathematics and in computer science. But coming home from university, I beheld the sight through my bedroom window. It was a private observatory built especially just for me by my late father, Leon Block. That observatory in our gardens even had a dome attached to a motor, allowing the dome to rotate with the sky. A special treat was to have the late Sir Patrick Moore from the United Kingdom feature my observatory in Krugersdorp on his BBC program, The Sky at Night. Patrick Moore's visit to my observatory in Krugersdorp was surely unforgettable, forever etched in my memory bank. The BBC TV crew first filmed us from outside the observatory. And then we moved inside, and inside the observatory housed the telescope. But it would actually accommodate a few people. Cameras clicked away as Sir Patrick Moore and I stood inside my observatory. It was in Krogersdorp that I became friendly with the late Professor Lewis Hurst, then a professor of genetics and medicine, who also lived in Krugersdorp. Professor Lewis Hurst had a great interest in astronomy, and for many hours we would discuss the complexities of the cosmos. I would delight in explaining to him fundamentals in astronomy, such as black holes or quasars. Intellectually, intellectually, I was satisfied. Allow me to repeat, intellectually, I was so satisfied. I became fascinated by the elegance of the mathematical formulation of general relativity. And I submitted my first research paper on that theme 
to the Royal Astronomical Society of London in 1973 at the age of 19. It was published in London one year later when I was 20 years old. Never could I ever have imagined that that very paper, written at age 19, would also be read by the late Dr. Alan Sandage in Pasadena, one of the greatest cosmologists of all time. How humbling it was for me to receive requests from observatories and universities for reprints or printed copies of that research paper, which I wrote at age 19. Requests from academics in Canada, to Israel, to the UK, to New Zealand, were invariably addressed to Dr. David Block. Little did anyone know overseas that my age was 20 and that I was merely a mister. So intellectually, I was so stimulated. But questions within my soul, within my very being, gripped me, and intensely so. Inwardly, something or someone was missing. Back in South Africa, my friendship with Professor Lewis Hurst grew, and I started sharing my thoughts and my feelings about the cosmos with him. To be brutally honest, I repeat, to be brutally honest, I did not know God. I shared my doubts with Professor Hurst. Are we, as Shakespeare said, or as Shakespeare reflected, just a fleeting shadow to appear and then disappear? What is the purpose for living? What is the raison d'etre for us being here on terra firma? Was it possible to ever have a personal encounter with the creator of the cosmos? I silently asked. Strangely, standing in the grounds of my parents' home in Krugersdorp, where I aimed my very first telescope, a four-and-a-half-inch reflector telescope at Saturn. And when I actually viewed Saturn in all its majesty and splendor with its tilted system of rings, I just knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that there was and is a great designer, but I had zero connection with him. In fact, I said to myself, there must still be a personal God out there, as I hear in the Shul synagogue. But to be brutally honest, I had not yet experienced his still, small voice of forgiveness, of forgiveness and reassurance in my heart. Sure, I would fast at Yom Kippur, but I had no assurance I did not know that I know that I know that I know that my Redeemer liveth. I had no such personal reassurance. An unusual turn in the story then followed. Professor Lewis Hurst asked me to meet a close friend of his, the Reverend John Spaker. We met the Reverend John Spaker at his manse in Johannesburg. The voice of the Reverend Spaker always commanded attention, for he spoke with authority. He took his Bible in his hands and turned the pages to the New Testament, in particular to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. In Romans, in the book of Romans, chapter 9 and verse 33, Paul affirms that Yeshua, Jesus, is a stumbling stone to my Jewish people. But they who freely choose to believe in Yeshua shall never be ashamed. Some of those words literally just jumped out at me. 
I quote, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For those watching me who might prefer a more modern rendition of this verse, allow me to read from the message, Eugene Peterson's The Message. I quote, careful, I've put a huge stone, a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion, a stone you can't get around, but the stone is me. If you're looking for me, you'll find me on the way, not, not in the way, quote, unquote. Oh, Zion, Mount Zion, the territory, the beloved territory of the Jewish people, my biblical home ground. And as that verse was read to me, it all instantaneously, immediately, instantaneously became very clear to me. Yeshua was the stumbling stone. As simple as that. Yeshua was the stumbling stone. The stumbling stone. My stumbling stone. Yeshua was my stumbling stone. Jesus had fulfilled all the messianic prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures, such as where the Jewish Messiah would be born, how he was to die, and much besides. While many of my Jewish people were and are still awaiting the Messiah, I suddenly knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus is the living Messiah, immediate revelation. All I had to do that day in 1976 was respond to his grace. I immediately asked the Reverend John Spaker to pray for me. I surrendered my heart and my reason to the Lord Jesus that day. The Spirit of Jesus infused every cell of my being. That was in October 1976. I was 22. God laid it upon my heart to pray for a Jewish wife, specifically for a young Jewish person to whom Jesus had also revealed himself. And that miracle happened. Her name, Elizabeth, or Liz, Kathleen Levitt. More Jewish you cannot get. Levitt, the tribe of Levi. We were married in the year 1982. Liz is the mother and I'm the proud father of three amazing young men, Aaron, Nathaniel, and Tevye. My private life. But then in my chosen career as an astronomer, I too have seen God work, inextricably involved in my research. Over the years, I have traveled to and use telescopes at some of the world's greatest observatories, from Chile to Hawaii. I adore photography. One of my greatest joys was securing this photograph of the Rosette Nebula. There are truly no words to describe its intricate and delicate beauty. The Rosette Nebula lies at a distance of some 5,000 light years from our Earth, and it measures approximately 130 light years in diameter. God has given me the privilege of working as a team with some of the most gifted astronomers alive. 
An unforgettable highlight in my career was when colleagues flew to the Seychelles. They were celebrating my 60th birthday by hosting an international astronomy conference in the Seychelles. Reflecting back in the formative stages of my professional research career, while observing the shapes or the morphologies of galaxies with their dark and pervasive clouds of cosmic dust, God had highlighted, God had highlighted one specific verse to me from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45. I'll go ahead of you, clearing and paving the road. I'm reading from the message. I'll break down bronzes, bronze city gates, smash padlocks, kick down barred entrances. I'll lead you to buried treasures, secret caches of valuables, confirmations that it is, in fact, I, God, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name, quote, unquote, from the message. In the King James Version, Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 3 reads as follows. Listen to this. This is the verse God gave David Block for his research. And I quote, And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel, quote, unquote. It was God, it was God, it was God speaking to me through the Scriptures by means of His Holy Spirit. He was going to reveal to me the hidden treasures of darkness, cosmic dust, dark cosmic dust grains, the material of which you and I are created, veritable stardust. I've publicly shared this verse from the book of Isaiah 45 on how God guided my research, on how the guiding hand of God was intimate in my life at the telescopes, wherever I found myself conducting research. I've shared this verse with audiences around the globe. To probe cosmic dust, I've also used images secured with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is a telescope in orbit about the sun. And the camera I used is a very special camera designed by my friend and collaborator at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, Giovanni Fazio. How special, how special it was, thinking back that I only come from a little mining town in Krugersdorp. How special it was for me to see an announcement by NASA and JPL bearing my name. We had used the Spitzer Space Telescope. God had given us the insight to probe great treasures of darkness including glowing rings of fire, as you see here, in the Andromeda spiral galaxy. To His glory, to His glory, and only because of His immeasurable grace has our research featuring cosmic dust and galaxies twice been featured on the cover of the world's most prestigious scientific journal by name Nature. As a teenager, standing alongside my telescope in Krugersdorp, I never knew I would one day write a book entitled God and Galileo, published by Crossway in Chicago. In those formative years in Krugersdorp, I never dreamed, I never dreamed that one day I would face a monster masquerading under the mantle of science 
We call this monster not science, but scientism. Scientism is atheism masquerading under the mantle of science. I never knew about scientism in the formative stages of my training. But one thing I know, God has raised me up. And as in the book of Esther, I'm born for such a time as this, beloved, to detonate the God delusion. Yes, God has raised me up to detonate the lies of scientism and of the God delusion. Meandering back in time to the 1980s, my very first book on astronomy and the creator, the Logos, God incarnate, the word incarnate, was entitled Star Watch. It was God and only God who by his grace led me to the right publisher at the right time in the United Kingdom. Here we see Professor Lewis Hurst holding a copy of my very first book, Star Watch. What an incredible story. A senior Professor Lewis Hurst and a young Jewish astronomer, me, David Block from Krugersdorp, who had been led to faith in Jesus through the actions of the senior professor standing alongside me. My book, Star Watch, was an absolute joy to write, for it combined so many of my interests, such as photography, astronomy, writing, the microcosm, the macrocosm, and much besides. And I was so chuffed to learn about a year or two ago, that Star Watch actually landed up on the shelves of the esteemed Christian thinker and writer, Philip Yancey, in the United States. Resonating deeply within my being as I share my testimony and bring it to a conclusion are these two words. Truth, grace. Truth, grace, grace, truth, as we read in John chapter 1 and verse 14. In my career, I fully understand by His grace alone that the truth of nature, science, is not the same as the nature of truth. I repeat, the truth of nature, science, is not the same as the nature of truth. The nature of truth includes spiritual revelation by means of God's Holy Spirit. I think of, this, of the incarnation. I think of that holy night. Oh yes, does that holy night, as seen in this incredible painting by the late Father Clarhout, does that holy night not indeed belong to the nature of truth? The moral of the story in my own testimony is that I have faced, I have faced influential Goliaths in my life. But hear me well, but hear me well, my name is David. Yes, I have faced my Goliaths, but my name is David, and my calling is, by His grace, secure. My personal experience has been that by God's grace, He has always set a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, as in Psalm 23 and verse 5. Many years have elapsed since I stood alongside my first telescope in Krugersdorp. 
Those were the days of non-digital photography. Now, of course, everything is digital, including the recording of this testimony. However, however, every time I look at images of the wonder, the wonder, the wonder, the splendor of God's creation, especially nowadays from telescopes in space, transmitting images back to Earth on computer screens. He always quietly stands next to me. Yes, as I behold stars being born, he always stands quietly so next to me. And all I have to do is behold and listen to his still small voice. In summary, his grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for me, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Throughout my career, I can bear testimony. I can bear testimony to God reaching out his hand to me, leading me, guiding me, protecting me. My motto is simple. As I stand under the aurora and I look up, my motto is simple. Never, 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 never give up, but look up. I remain enthralled by the grace and love of Jesus, the luminous figure, the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Amen.